Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name's Eric. For those of y'all that don't know me, I'm one of the elders here at the Way. And it is an honor and a privilege to preach this morning as we prepare to appoint Mr. Ron Osborne to eldership. Uh, so because of the fact that today is a special appointment day, we are stepping out of 1 Peter, and we will actually, or stepping out of 2 Peter, and we will actually be in 1 Peter chapter 5 this morning. 1 Peter is widely considered to be the first letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to believers who were being persecuted in Asia Minor by the Emperor Nero. Nero was a very wicked, prideful man. The city of Rome had been burnt. The city of Rome had been burnt down, and it was widely believed that Nero was the one who started the city ablaze. So, in order to, in order to take the, remove the, uh, in order to re redirect the hostility of the Romans, Nero had blamed the Christians, and extreme persecution came towards the Christians because of this. It said, to, it said that Nero actually would take Christians while they were alive and light his garden with them. So this letter was wrote to, to Christians who were going through some very trying, difficult times. The purpose of it was to bring them hope during these trying times and to remind them of the beautiful inheritance that they would receive at Christ's return. And also, to, for them to live, to live, also reminding them the way they should live in the midst of the persecution, following the example that was set by Christ when he was persecuted. Our passage is 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eager, eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown, the unfading crown of glory. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I just ask that you open our hearts and prepare our minds for the implanted word this morning, Father. The hearts are cut and that repentance is given. <coughs> Lord, be with us this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. We start out with Peter exhorting the local elders of the, local, of the churches in, in Asia Minor. Peter is not throwing out the title that he can rightfully claim as Apostle with a capital A. He is not making himself seem holier than thou. He exhorts them with the title, your fellow elder. Now this is the same Peter that was one of the 12 apostles. And one of the 12 apostles, one of the three in the inner circle of Christ. Yet Peter sees himself no greater than the rest. He gives us an example of what humble service looks like. Unfortunately, in this day and age, there have been people who have crept into the church and with such pride sees themselves greater than the rest of the body. They are placed on a pedestal and became almost an idol. Darian just got back from Rome and she got to witness this firsthand when she saw the Pope. And the masses amount of people who come and just try to, just wanting to be close to the Pope and get pictures with the Pope. This is just another man. 
who ties his shoes just like we do every single day. This is a lie put forth by the enemy. It's in order to distract us from Christ. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, is responding to some division that's going on in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 12 and 13, he says, Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What Paul is telling them is that if you place a certain individual above others, then your eyes are off Christ and on that other person. We see this so much today with famous pastors and people on the TV, like, this is the person I follow. We are not called to follow anyone other than Christ. Not only is Peter to share the role of leadership and suffering with the local elders, he also shares in the coming glory that is to be revealed. Peter has already seen a partial glimpse of this on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John. The book of Matthew, chapter 17, gives us this example. Starting in verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, my, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed him. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up. And do not be afraid. Lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. The experience was overwhelming for the apostles. So much so that they fell on their faces in fear. The same John that was there had a similar experience later on in Revelation. When the glorious Christ came before him when he was, in the, when he was on Patmos on the Lord's day. And it says he fell at his feet like a dead man. Nothing more is humbling than coming before the glory of Christ. Seeing Christ in all his glory breaks any pride that one may have. We carry on in verse 2. And this is where the exhortation begins to the elders. He tells them to shepherd the flock of God, of God among them. In the book of John, chapter 21, Jesus himself gives Peter this exact same exhortation to shepherd his, Jesus' flock. Starting in verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. <coughs> Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. The word used for shepherd in Greek is poimam, poimana. I got pronounced that wrong. <laughs> Which means to tend, to shepherd, and to govern. Govern would imply we, as elders, are to exercise, exercise oversight over the body. We're to make decisions and lead, lead the people by the standards that God has given us through his written word. It is Jesus's it is Jesus's flock. It is Jesus's flock and his word tells us exactly how we should conduct his business. Elders should never make decisions that cannot be backed up with scripture. We're to shepherd according to how he has told us. A shepherd should also mean to feed and tend to the flock. Feeding is to teach them the word of God, where we have the preaching and the proclaiming of God's word on Sunday morning, and we have the discipleship on Wednesday afternoons, and the countless other times with home groups on Sunday evenings that the elders should be teaching the flock, feeding the flock. So an elder must be able to teach that is the only qualification that differs in 1 Timothy between an elder and a deacon, is that an elder is able to teach. The preaching and teaching of God's word is the primary duty of an elder. In Acts 6, they were having issues with the, Hellenistic, uh, the widows of the Hellenistic Jews not being fed. And the, and the apostles couldn't take the time to tend to the flock, to, to feed the tables and tend the tables. So we appointed, they appointed deacons. Starting in two, verse, starting in uh, a chapter, or verse two. So the twelve summoned the congregation of disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, this doesn't mean that they never serve tables, but it shows that their primary task is to spiritually feed the flock. The primacy of the elder is to proclaim and instruct the flock through the word of God. To be messengers of Christ to Christ's people. Tending is a part of this as well. And it also means that the elders are to protect the flock from wolves that might try to, that might try to creep in and harm the flock. We are actually right now currently in a series in 2 Peter titled Truth War. And we're going through this, this title right now for the very purpose of that. So that you may know truth. So you can see through the lies of the enemy when they're presented to you. So many of the epistles were wrote for this very purpose. Wolves have crept into the churches in the early church. And we're trying to mislead the, the people of God. 
In Galatians Paul chapter 2, Paul tells us of Peter himself being rebuked by Paul for this very reason. Starting in verse 11. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not the Jews, how is it to compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? Peter was trying to place the burden of the law on the people they were set free from. And Paul called him out on it. Likewise, we here at the way are very vigilant in the protection of the people to make sure that they are not led astray, that y'all are not led astray by false doctrine, to make sure that there's not a burden placed on y'all that y'all were never meant to bear. All of this is something we do not do under compulsion as if we are forced to do it. Nor is it against what we truly desire. You see, this call is not something that comes natural to a man. It is not anything that comes from themselves. This call is from God to the will of God. God gives the elders the gifts and the desires to accomplish his purposes. The elders' whole life has been leading them to this very pur purpose. The, God, the elders' whole life has been leading to this, this to this point because God has planned it from the beginning. Ephesians 10 tells us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God had prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. The only, one, the only reason one becomes an elder is because God planned it, purposed it, created it, and gifted them for it, and then carries them through it. It is not an easy call, but, God, but Christ's strength, he sees the elder through it. But it is not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. For the elders are never intended to become rich off the flock. In reality, becoming an elder or a leader, an overseer of the church, is not even a wise move financially. <laughs> You're not going to become a wealthy man from this, if done right and biblically. The scripture calls for teachers to earn something, but that's not the goal. The reward of the elder is to see is to see the flock grow in the knowledge and love of God. There is no greater pay than that. I absolutely love having conversations with Dakota. That man loves talking about the Lord. And there's nothing better than when I'm having a conversation with him and the Lord has revealed something new to him through his word and his faith face is just lit up with joy. That is the, that is the reward for the elders. To see in the joy of the, on the faces of the people as God has shown himself to them. As they behold Christ no better joy is there than that. 
So if you haven't had a conversation with Dakota, have a conversation with him. I can guarantee you, if you have, it's been about the Lord. That man will talk for hours about the Lord. But Peter continues on with his exhortation to the elders. In verse 3, he says, Not yet lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, it gives us a very clear example of what lording, shepherds lording it over the flock looks like. If you'll turn over to Ezekiel 34. Starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying son of man prophesy against the shepherds of Israel <laughs> prophesy and say to those shepherds to the shepherds thus says the Lord God woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves should shepherds not feed the flock you eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The disease, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. They were scattered for a lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. <clears throat> My flock was scattered over the surface of the earth and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my flock has become a prey. My flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field, for a lack of shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the words of the Lord. Thus says, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth so they will not be food for them. See, the, the shepherds of Israel were out for sordid gain. They were not tending or feeding the flock. They were not concerned about the well-being of the sheep. They were more focused on their own prideful gain. They showered. They showed their lack of care for the people. It did not set a godly example for them. This continues on through the time of Christ. With the uh, Pharisees. The Pharisees placed themselves on this high pedestal that the flock could never attain. It was almost as if this is a position you, should, you would never be able to reach. The same thing with the Pope in the Catholic Church. He placed, they placed this man on a pedestal. He is just another man of <clears throat> flesh and blood. We see time and time again mega millionaire pastors of these massive, massive churches on TV all the time. Send me money for a blessing from God, from God. That's not from Scripture. That is straight from the pits of hell. They live their lives. They're multimillionaires who squander the less fortunate and live off the backs of the lower class. They feed lies to millions in order to gain. It can even be seen locally. I was a part of a church. And the senior pastor there 
was a very prideful man. And every Sunday you would see him. He would be right there after service. And the ones he would be talking to were the, the powerful and the wealthy of the community. But the lowly and the lower class to him would rarely be seen. I actually ran a homeless ministry for this church. And he would get up there and talk about how great this ministry is doing. He was there one time. He came one time to be with the, with the, with the lower class, with the needy, with the, with the less fortunate, with the ones that were hungry, with the ones that were lacking. It's a shame. It's a crying shame to see the, sh the people, the shepherds abusing the flock. That's not from God. That is straight from the enemy. <laughs> the senior pastors have a salad. That's why church growth plans are so destructive. You know what the church growth here at the way is? We will preach and proclaim the word of God and trust God for the rest. When you have a pastor whose main salary is coming from the body, that his worry is about the butts in the seat and the wallets that are in them to secure his paycheck. Yes, like I said, there is a call for the shepherds or the teachers to get a stipend, but that's not the purpose. It says in verse 3, those allotted to your charge. Once again, church growth. What's church growth is? Trust God for the rest. Jesus says he will build his church. We don't put in programs and placements in order to drag people in. I had a conversation just last night or was listening in on conversation just last night and a pastor of a uh, fairly decent sized church in this community was talking about their goal for this year was 180 baptisms. And I was cut to the heart by that. It saddened me. Because at the same church that I talked about just a, little, a few minutes ago, that was their goal. I was once showed a, on the wall, a, what you call it? It's a, a list of Southern Baptist churches in Middle Tennessee and the number of baptisms. And the leadership of the church knew that I was being called to leadership. They also knew the way I leaned with my beliefs. And we are not bashful about how we believe. We believe here at the way that God is sovereign. We believe and proclaim and preach in the elect. And we will talk about predestination. Well, they were not a fan of this at this other church. It comes from the word of God, but they were not a fan. And he, I was called, sent, brought over to look at this chart, and it said, do you see this church right here? Talking about a good-sized church in Middle Tennessee. He said, they used to be number two, and now they're down here at number five. About baptisms, all because they got a preacher who preaches on predestination. And I asked him, I said, when? Did this become about how many people we baptize? Because that's how that church was. It was, look how many people we baptize. And I would walk down the, up the hallway of the church every Sunday. And you would see countless, countless pictures of people who were baptized and were gone. They came in, they'd make a profession of faith. They were baptized and told that their sins had been forgiven. And now they were their salvation is guaranteed, but they weren't in the body no more. They were gone. And it saddened me that the main priority of these churches is baptizing people and getting them in the door. The main, the main priority of the churches is giving them Christ. That's what the leadership should do. Let the church, let the body behold Christ. Proclaim the word of God. Not trust in cleverly designed, devised plans for man, but believe and trust that the Lord says he will build his church 
and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And know that when he says it, it will be. Elders are also to set the example. And I thought about this this morning, what that example is. As I pondered on it, that example, yes, godly living is important. If there is a part of that. But the example that we set as elders to the flock is not, well, this is how you should do this, and this is how you should do that. No, no, no. That's not the example. The example we set is humility. We set the example that was showed to us. If our example that we set is, this is how you must live, and you must do this, then we have failed y'all horribly. You can never earn your salvation. You can never trust in your work. We're told even our best works are considered filthy rags. So the example that was given to us, probably the best example, the, there is no other greater example than we've ever seen from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is the example that we will set. Christ, the creator, sustainer of all things. The one who is, who was, and is to come. Who is there from the beginning and will be till the end. Through the end. He stepped off his throne of glory. Became born in the flesh of a man. Become born in the flesh. Born of a virgin woman. Was perfectly obedient to the law. Yes, the law he created. But humbled himself to the point. That he was. Cursed. He was beat. By the same people he came to save. He was stripped naked and nailed to a tree. He died. He took on the full wrath of the sin of his church and died. Was buried and then raised three days later. Christ gave us the example we set. And that's humility. No other, there is no greater example of humility. The same man who created everything got to his knees and washed the feet of his disciples. Elders are not. But we set the example of humility that Christ has set for us. The, obe the obedience of that, uh, that verse in Philippians 2 was the humility. Elders are not to think more highly of themselves than the flock. They are to sacrifice their time for the people they love and lead. They are to give everything and take nothing. As Brad likes to say, we should have to crawl into bed every night so exhausted that we barely have the strength to get there because we have poured everything we have left, everything left. We have poured everything we had out to others. That we should have nothing left. And when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive the unfading crown of glory, which we will then turn and fall down at the feet of the Lord and cast that crown at his feet. Revelations 4:10 verses Revelations 4, 10 and 11. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on his throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. And they will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive honor and power. 
For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. It says we will receive the crown of life as elders when the chief shepherd appears. And I say, yet not I, but Christ through me. You see, there are no more, wor no more truer words spoken to me than when my pride gets hurt or when I desire over others. And my baby tells me, it's not about you. It's about Christ. Get over yourself. There's nothing better than having a good godly wife to remind you. <laughs> she reminds me that I am not my own, that my life is not my own, that I have been bought with a price, and that my life belongs to Christ. That's what it's all about. As elders, we lay everything that we have to the side. And we give everything that we have been given to the flock. We take nothing. We want for nothing. And we trust that God will provide us the strength to get through it. That is the importance of eldership. We don't, we don't place the people that are wealthy or that have power in the community above the others. We don't come and say, we've got a special seat up front reserved for you. No. We don't care if you are the most powerful, most wealthiest man in the earth, on, in the community. If the president himself was to walk through this door, we're not going to show him any more honor than we would a homeless man that comes off the street. Because everyone is created in the image of God. There's no one greater. The only person that we would give more glory was if Jesus returned today and was to walk through those doors, then we would, everybody in this, in this church would fall to their face like a dead man and praise and worship and honor him because it is him that done it, not us. And we will always, always do our best to show that to you as elders. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, it is you, not us. Lord, you called us and gifted us for your purposes, not ours. We trust that you are working it all out. Lord, as we prepare to appoint Ron, we are so grateful for this man. Such a rock he has been for this body, for this community. We thank you for the godly men and women that you have brought in here. Lord, continue to strengthen us and grow us in your word. We will trust in you to build your church. We will proclaim your word faithfully. And that is it. Humble us this day. Keep us humble and in service to you. Don't let nobody see anything of us, but only of your son Christ. It is in the precious and powerful and magnificent name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.